Hello, today we're starting a new series on the Holy Spirit. And uh, I envision this series taking place over a few different phases. Um, so for this first part, we will look at the spirit in scripture and tradition, uh, looking at the role of the Holy Spirit um, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and then the early church. In a later sub-series, we'll look at what it means to live in the spirit, looking at things like how to receive the spirit, spiritual gifts, and spiritual practices. And then in a, in a further part, looking at uh, more of a theological lens, considering uh, the spirit vis-a-vis -vis the Trinity. So a lot of interesting things we can talk about. Um, for today, though, we will begin with the spirit in the Old Testament. Before we get into it, uh, it's worth pointing out um, this basic uh, method of interpreting the Bible, which is that in tracing the Holy Spirit through the Bible and the early church, we need to keep in mind this notion of the progress of revelation. That is to say, the person and work of the Holy Spirit is revealed progressively over time and not all at once. Um, J.I. Packer, I think, summarizes this, this well. J.I. Packer reminds us that while the truth of the Trinity is a New Testament revelation, nevertheless, the right way for followers of Christ to read the Old Testament is in the light of all that was revealed in and through Christ, and that now lies before us in the New Testament. And so even if the writers of the Old Testament themselves weren't uh, cognizant of the Spirit as the third person of the divine trinity, uh, nevertheless, as Christians, we can go back and read the Old Testament in light of the truth of God as trinity. Um, today, though, we'll, we'll look in particular at what the Old Testament says about uh, the Holy Spirit, and while we don't see as much attention to the Spirit given as we do in the New Testament or in the early church, nevertheless, uh, carefully looking at the Old Testament does reveal, I would say, three major areas uh, where we find the Spirit at work. And those are creation, community, and consummation. Before we get into those, though, uh, it's worth talking about uh, the term that we translate spirit. Uh, in Hebrew, that would be ruach. Um, the term ruach is found some 389 times in the Old Testament, and it has a pretty broad semantic range. Um, not every time ruach is used uh, is it referring to the spirit, capital S. Uh, for one thing, we see a lot of instances where ruach simply means wind uh, as a force of nature under God's sovereign control. We also see a lot of instances in which ruach means breath, as in the essence of life given by God. Sometimes ruach can refer to spirit, as in the character or attitude of a person or a group of people. And then, and this is where we're most interested, there are some instances of ruach where it appears to refer to something more metaphysical in nature. Um, something like a distinct divine being, if you will, uh, as J.I. Packer calls it, to God's power in action, <clears throat> particularly where we see the phrases, the spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord, or the Holy Spirit, particularly in these instances, uh, it appears to be pressing for a meaning uh, that is, is more of a distinct uh, divine being. So I bring all this up because you'll see different translations of the Bible uh, tackle the translation of ruach in different ways. So for instance, Genesis 1-2, um, a very famous, very important passage with the creation of the world, it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the ruach of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So some translations simply take this as wind, uh, as an impersonal force. Um, other translations take this as spirit with a capital S. Um, and I think to go back to the Packer quote we opened with, 
I think as Christians following the church fathers, it makes sense to read this as the spirit, even if the author of Genesis may not have had that in mind. As Christians reading the Bible in the fullness of our understanding of God as Trinity, a verse like Genesis 1-2 should almost certainly be read with ruach, meaning the spirit. All right, so let's walk through these three uh, areas in which we see the spirit operative in the Old Testament. Um, we'll look at a lot of Bible verses today, so get ready, buckle up. So first, the spirit is active in the work of creation. <clears throat> so for instance, we see the spirit present at the creation of the cosmos. Uh, we already looked at Genesis 1-2. Additionally, Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath, the ruach of his mouth, all their host. Job 26, 13, by the wind, ruach, the heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. So we get these other instances, um, and again, it's not clear what sense of ruach is necessarily meant, and yet... Um, again, reading from a Christian perspective, what we know to be true about the Spirit from the New Testament, um, from the theology of the early church, we can very plausibly interpret these instances of Ruach as referring to the Holy Spirit. Um, back to Genesis 1-2, I like this quote from Calvin. How do we make sense of um, the Spirit of God hovering over this formless uh, void? Calvin says, the spirit is here getting the undigested mass of the initial creation ready for subsequent acts of divine creation. Um, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. The spirit is also present at the creation of human beings. So most famously, Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So again, if we read a text like this through the lens of uh, Christian Trinitarian theology, um, this us would certainly then mean the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, not only does the Spirit create things, but the Spirit also sustains things. Um, we see this, for instance, in Genesis 6, 3, the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh. Likewise, in Psalm 104, when you hide your, fat, your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. So as long as God's breath, the spirit, is within us, we're alive. But when God removes his spirit, um, that, that is our death. B.W. Anderson on this point. Creation is not just an event that occurred in the beginning at the foundation of the earth, but as God's continuing activity of sustaining creatures and holding everything in being. So besides creation, we also see the spirit active in the formation uh, and guidance of the community of the people of God, the people of Israel. So, for instance, we see that the Spirit forms Israel at the time of the Exodus deliverance. So, Isaiah 63, verse 11. Then God remembered the days of old of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses? who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name. Likewise, Nehemiah 9.20. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. So somehow the Exodus uh, was a Trinitarian uh, action. You see in the New Testament, Christ uh, led them out of Egypt. Uh, and so here we see the spirit active in the formation of, of Israel as the people of God. Moreover, the spirit mediates God's presence to Israel. So Exodus 31, uh, <clears throat> the Lord says to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. 
And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, so it was the spirit of God that enabled Bezalel uh, to produce these things for the worship of God. Likewise, in First, uh, First Chronicles 28, verse 12, we get this very interesting um, statement about the spirit and worship. Um, here I'm quoting from the NIV instead of the ESV with the other ones, uh, because the NIV pulls this out of the Hebrew. Uh, talking about David giving his son Solomon the plans for the temple, it says, David gave Solomon the plans of all that the spirit had put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms for the treasuries of the temple of God and for the treasuries for the dedicated things. <clears throat> so what we see is that the spirit was actually guiding the creation of uh, the items in the tabernacle and uh, the temple itself. And so clearly the spirit cares quite a bit about the aesthetics of our worship. That's maybe something we wanna follow up more on uh, in the Zoom call, but very interesting point. We also see that the spirit enables the leadership of Israel. <clears throat> um, so we have, for instance, um, with Moses, um, when Moses in Numbers 11 uh, is told to gather 70 elders, uh, Numbers 11, verse 17, uh, God says, I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you may not bear it yourself alone. Uh, we see God's spirit residing on the judges of Israel. So just one example, Judges 6, 34, but the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. Uh, so the spirit descends in a special way on the judges. And then we see this with the early kings uh, of Israel. So 1 Samuel 16, 13 and 14. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. So it seems like in the Old Testament, the spirit of God is given in a special way uh, to Israel's leaders, uh, and it can also be removed, uh, transferred uh, between Israel's leaders. Now, one interesting thing to point out is that the Old Testament never claims that any king after David, not even the great uh, King Josiah, are ever said to be spirit-enabled in the way that we just talked about with these previous judges and kings. Very interesting. Finally, as we know, the spirit inspires the prophets of Israel. So Micah 3.8, Micah says, but as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord, with justice and might. Ezekiel 11.5, and the spirit of the Lord fell upon me. Um, and we get this throughout the prophets. So there's this clear sense in which that the prophets are speaking uh, as they've been inspired by the Holy Spirit. Finally, in the Old Testament, we see a cluster of references to the Spirit being active in the coming consummation of God's purposes. So that there's some, some later fulfillment that's going to come from the perspective of the Old Testament in which the Holy Spirit will play a major role. So first we see that the Spirit would specially endow Israel's coming Messiah in an unparalleled manner. Um, think about Isaiah 11, picking up in verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Uh, likewise, um, in Isaiah 42, 1, behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. In Isaiah 61, 1, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. So somehow this coming Messiah is going to be filled with the spirit 
um, in a unique way that even transcends how previous Old Testament figures had received the Holy Spirit. But it's not just the Messiah who would uh, receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> in fact, the Old Testament hints that the Spirit would recreate God's people in their entirety. And that in fact, <clears throat> rather than just rest upon certain leaders or artists, that the Spirit would come to indwell all of God's people. Ezekiel 36, 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Or Ezekiel 37, after the vision of the valley of dry bones, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Um, or Isaiah 44, verse three, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Uh, most famously, though, we get this prophecy in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. So here we have a prophecy of Pentecost, uh, when the Holy Spirit will come to rest on all Christians. Um, note, by the way, this is a fulfillment of Moses's hope back in Numbers 11.29. Uh, Moses had said, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Um, and so even Moses, back uh, towards the beginning of the Old Testament story, um, longed for this day when the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all of God's people. Finally, we see that at some future time, the spirit would recreate the earth itself. Um, Isaiah 32, 14 and 15. For the palace is forsaken, the populous city deserted. The hill and the watchtower will become dens forever. A joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. Until the spirit is poured upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. Likewise, Isaiah 44, three to five. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob and another will write on his hand, the Lord's and name himself by the name of Israel. So there seems to be this connection uh, between the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the renewal of the earth. Um, so here's G.A. Cole. God's concerns are not limited to the human domain. Nothing less than the wider creation provides his palette. And the poured out spirit is the brush that returns the color to the canvas. So that's just a brief survey of some of the key themes regarding the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Um, for our Zoom catechesis discussion, it might be good to talk about how does the Old Testament view of the Spirit anticipate that of the New Testament? Or if we want to have more of a, uh, a theological discussion where there's multiple views that, that theologians hold, we could get into this interesting question of were Old Testament believers regenerate by the Holy Spirit. Then next week, we'll look at the role of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament.